aquamastine, the first substance shown in an actual randomized trial of humans with multiple sclerosis to have the potential for myelin regeneration or remyelination. This is an FDA approved drug for another indication that is readily available. Today we will discuss the history and science behind clomastine. Let's have some fun. One thing that's interesting about multiple sclerosis is that it's very common for people to improve, to get better, to recover from disability, particularly when it's associated with relapses and active lesions. Part of that is due to reduction of inflammation, but part of that is due to the body's own capacity for remyelination. And people talk about stem cells in multiple sclerosis, but it turns out that you have something even better than stem cells already in your brain. Research shows that about 4% of the cells in the nervous system are oligodendrocyte precursor cells, the cells that are capable of moving towards sites of injury and growing myelin. And in fact, it is possible for myelin to regenerate, and that is often the substrate for improvement in multiple sclerosis. However, in many people with MS, the remyelination is incomplete or absent. And the legendary neuropathologist, Dr. Bruce Trapp, demonstrated that even people with advanced progressive multiple sclerosis often have the oligodendrocyte precursor cells in the demyelinated lesions, but they don't necessarily remyelinate. And we don't exactly know why. Now, many substances have been purported to cause remyelination in basic science or animal studies. But only one substance, clomastine, has demonstrated success in an actual randomized trial in humans. And that's what we're going to talk about today. By the way, I'm Brandon Bieber. I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday. So please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Now, just to look at oligodendrocyte development. You start with stem cells and they differentiate into OPCs or oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And then they later differentiate into oligodendrocytes, which can create myelin. And then ultimately they mature and stop remyelinating and just function on supporting the existing cells and myelin. And there are a lot of different substances thought to work at different pathways. For instance, if you look at lingo, L-I-N-G-O, that is involved in oligodendrocyte differentiation. And there's a drug called anti-lingo, which is a currently developed substance, which is thought to possibly cause uh, remyelination, and that's in development for multiple sclerosis as well right now. Now, the man to your left upper corner is the legendary Dr. Jonah Chan, who completed a study in 2013 demonstrating that clomastine is capable of remyelination. And the idea that he had is that he would screen existing FDA approved drugs for the potential for remyelination and hope to get lucky. Out of hundreds and hundreds of drugs, perhaps one would deliver us some incidental effect on remyelination. Now, it would be very difficult to take animals, give them each drug, cut their brains, analyze the tissues one by one, have people count the myelin rings in injured areas. And so what he ingeniously set up was an automated screen. The image to the left lower corner is a silica micro pillars. In other words, they're these cones of silica. And he was able to trick the oligodendrocytes into wrapping them with myelin. And then he set up a fluorescent screen for myelin basic protein so that he could have a computer screen them automatically so that they didn't have to be counted one by one. And if you look at the next slide, you can see these beautiful pictures of these cones being myelinated by oligodendrocytes. This is a scanning electron microscope. Now, what did the results show? Out of all of the hundreds and hundreds of FDA approved drugs, most of them did absolutely nothing. But a small number shown in blue seemed to have some capability of remyelination. And then one with the greatest number of myelin basic protein or myelin containing positive rings was the drug clomastine. Now there are other drugs as well, and you may recognize some of them. Oxybutynin is ditropan, a drug used for neurogenic bladder. Ketiapine is Seroquel, used as an antipsychotic drug and for sleep. Benztropine is actually an anticholinergic drug used to treat some of the side effects of Parkinson's disease medications. Ipratropium is atrophent, used to treat asthma and COPD. 
Trospium is Sanctura, also used to treat neurogenic bladder in multiple sclerosis. All these drugs actually have one thing in common. More on that later. So what is clomastine? Well, it's a simple small molecule, and it was originally patented in 1960 as an antihistamine drug. It's an H1 antagonist. Now, the drug isn't really used anymore because it's very sedating. It's kind of like Benadryl. We just sort of have better drugs like Zyrtec or Allegra or Claritin that are less sedating. So it's hard for people to take this drug during the day. Now, in the United States, it goes by the trade name Tavist. It, you may also see it in other countries as Tevedril. But one thing that's important is that it has effects other than acting on the histamine receptor. It also blocks the M1 and M3 muscarinic receptors. More on that later. Now, he found that this drug seems to cause remyelination in rats, but does it actually work in animals who have a version of multiple sclerosis known as experimental autoimmune encephalitis, an inflammatory disease that we can induce in rats, which is similar to multiple sclerosis? The answer is yes. In this study, comparing clomastine versus vehicle, which is another name for the rats that did not receive clomastine, the animals that received clomastine had less disability based on this EAE score. And you can see the graph there. Red are the animals that received clomastine versus black, the animals that received nothing. Now, if you actually cut their brains and you do myelin stains with fluoromyelin, you can see that the vehicle mice, those that did not receive clomastine, had more demyelination. And in clomastine, they had remyelination. And you can see more green representing the myelin formation. And there are various studies demonstrating that clomastine did not block demyelination or reduce inflammation. It actually caused remyelination. But does it work in humans? The man in the upper right is the heralded Dr. Ari Green, who actually tested clomastine in humans with multiple sclerosis. Now, he looked at people with MS who have optic neuropathy, in other words, who have signs of optic nerve injury, but who did not have active optic neuritis. And he did a 150-day crossover trial. So there were 50 patients total. 25 initially received clomastine. 25 received placebo. And then they crossed over. And he found that those who received clomastine, on average, had better conduction through the optic nerve to the brain. So there's a test we do called visual evoke potentials, where we shine a checkerboard light, and then we record in the occipital lobe, the visual area of the brain, and we can record how long it takes for that information to get from the eye to the brain. And usually it takes about 100 milliseconds, and that's why we're looking at something called the P100. But this amount was, is actually prolonged in people who have optic nerve disease, but it was reduced somewhat in people who are taking clomastine by a modest amount but a statistically significant amount. And here you can see the data. The red line is those who were initially randomized to placebo, and the blue line is those who were initially randomized to clomastine. And you can see after three months, they crossed over. And then those who initially got clomastine, even though they were now getting placebo, seem to maintain their reduced latency. Whereas those who now got clomastine, they didn't change at all. And then suddenly when they got clomastine, they started having better conduction through the optic nerve to the brain. And this was, in fact, statistically significant. Now, they also looked at something called low contrast visual acuity, which is a measure of visual acuity using low contrast images. This is commonly done in clinical trials because it's very sensitive for very small changes in visual acuity. And you can see those who got clomastine seemed to do a little bit better, but it was not statistically significant. It was only a very modest difference that did not reach statistical significance. Now, what about other research? There are a lot of animal studies suggesting that clomastine has some benefits. For example, clomastine reduces behavioral changes in socially isolated mice and enhances myelination in the prefrontal cortex. Now, I talked a lot about the muscarinic receptors. And it turns out that even though clomastine is an antihistamine medication, it turns out the effect on remyelination has absolutely nothing to do with the histamine receptor. It has everything to do with the M1 muscarinic receptor. And all those other drugs that I showed you in the screen, like benztropine and oxybutynin and Sanctura, they are all muscarinic antagonists, specifically M1 muscarinic antagonists. 
And they actually demonstrated that if you knock out the M1 receptor, in other words, take mice and make it so they don't even have the gene for the M1 receptor in their nervous system, they have accelerated remyelination even without clomastine. Now, the next step is where do we go from here? There is an ongoing clinical trial called the recovery tr trial also done at University of California, San Francisco, where Dr. Green and his colleagues are recruiting, recruiting people with active optic neuritis to see if the drug helps people actually recover from optic neuritis. If you're interested in participating in that trial and you live in the Northern California area, I'll post a link in the notes below. If you have any questions or requests for future videos or comments, please post in the comments below.